you guys hear my voice yes <clears throat> master can you hear us oh uh, yes yeah that's good uh, i think uh, uh, we need to give the co-host to the ustad and the brother right hand uh, and and also i think he, he will share some slides i think yes so can you see the slides now uh yes yeah it will be in the screen ini buat di masjid iya enggak usah lah pakai masjid ya enggak perlu laut dikit ya iya assalamualaikum jason ini taruh di dekat leher iya ini taruh di kantong aja I think we can we can stop the recording until we are ready I think <clears throat> Is the speaker brother Rehan already in the in the masjid Yes it's on Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Can you speak a bit louder? Should oh. we start the? Uh, should we start now? Or? Yeah. Okay. 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 Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillahirobbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Sayyidina wa nabiyina al karim Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sabi ajmain. Alhamdulillah. We thanks Allah that Allah give us opportunity to meet again today. Uh, for our uh, monthly uh, Muslim Halakha. Uh, this event, uh, we try to schedule this event every month and it's organized by the New Muslim Circle. Uh, it's under uh, American Baitul Mal uh, in Houston, uh, Istiqlal Masjid in, uh, at Houston, Texas. So inshallah, uh, today the topic is uh, Muslims after Ramadan. So we know that Ramadan passed uh, less than two months ago, and we see, you know, we, we saw full worshippers like uh, Muslims in the masjid in Ramadan, but now it is much less fewer people uh, attending the masjid. So many people ask like how, how we keep or maintain our level of Iman, the faith that we feel during Ramadan and uh, make ourselves istiqamah or steadfast after Ramadan. And then uh, how will we will continue uh, to worship Allah and do good deeds with the same eagerness or energy uh, as we have been doing in Ramadan and what uh, kind of good deeds that we can plan and prepare for uh, meeting the next Ramadan inshallah. So regarding this inshallah we are going to uh, listen to the talk uh, given by uh, our Ustaz uh, brothers uh, Rehan Saifullah is a Muslim activist from Houston Texas. Uh, I have a short biography here uh, for um, Ustaz Rehan Saifullah. He graduated from uh, University of Houston with a bachelor degree in electrical engineering. He then went to Texas Tech University, obtained uh, a law degree, and currently works as a patent uh, attorney. Uh, Brother Rehan is a student of Sheikh Sheikh uh, Abdul Maksud, and he is currently pursuing studies in Arabic and Shafi'i Fiqh. So I, I hope uh, uh, we're going to have a presentation later and discussion, uh, question answer, inshallah. Uh, before that, uh, we're going to listen to the recitation of the Quran. Uh, it will be recited by Brother Rehan in uh, Masjid Istiqlal, inshallah. Okay. A'udhu billahi minash rajim. إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار 
baru. Wanahadila ayatil liulil albab. In alladina yazkuru nallah kiyaman wa kuudaw wa ala wa ala junubihim wa yatafakkarun wa yatafakkarun fi khalqis samawati wal ardi rabbana ma khalaqta hadza batilan 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 subhanal ka fakina azab Benar. Sadaqallahul azim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, most surely in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day, there are signs for men who understand. Those who remember Allah standing and sitting and lying on their sides and reflects on the creation of the heavens and the earth our lord thou has not created this in vain glory to thee save us then from the chastisement of the fire sadaqallahu <clears throat> alazim jazakallah khair uh, brother rehan so inshallah uh, we're gonna start the talk uh, so the program will be after the uh, presentation uh, there will be question answer uh, following the presentation uh, i hope the uh, ustad uh, rehan already there assalamualaikum ustad rehan Waalaikumsalam, good to see you, good to meet you. So inshallah, uh, we're going to start with the presentation and afterwards we're going to have a discussion uh, and then um, maybe uh, you're going to summarize and uh, make dua for everyone inshallah. Inshallah. So assalamu alaikum to everyone. Um, if I go long, please do stop me. <laughs> um, I have a habit of going over. Um, I do want to begin by saying that uh, you know, I'm not an alim, but um, I've studied a little bit of the deen and I've worked with the youth uh, since I was myself very young. And to give you a uh, context for this talk, I think it's helpful to explain who I am, where I've been, what my background was. Um, I'm originally from Pakistan. My father's from India. My mother's from uh, Pakistan itself. So my ancestry goes back to India. But I was, we moved to Canada when I was about five years old. And so I grew up in Canada in Montreal and came to Houston when I was uh, about 20 years old. And so I've been in Houston ever since. But early on, you know, growing up in Canada, I realized that there was a identity shift in, in the Muslims. So the, our parents are coming from overseas from their country. They have a different thinking. They have a different understanding. They have a different culture. And we're going, growing up in a completely different place. And so a lot of the youth didn't understand the religion of Islam um, like the parents did. And there was a disconnect often. And so I was very uh, interested in how the youth were looking at the religion, how they were interfacing with their parents. And so I've been involved ever since, uh, even in Houston, you know, we had different halakas in this area. Uh, the masjid over here on Sinat, the masjid Maryam, um, you know, I think, I don't think Istiqlal was here back then. Um, and so it, it's been a, a concern of mine to see how the, the, the young Muslims especially um, are, are, are seeing Islam. And so one of the things that I have seen is in the, the countries that we come from, you know, the Muslim countries, quote unquote, the ones that have majority Muslim populations, a lot of the things that we do are really done as rote things, meaning they're done because everyone does it. You don't question the things. So if someone's, if we're fasting, if we're praying five times a day, we're going to Juma, there's no real question about it. Not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's a good thing to actually have everyone doing the same thing. 
But what that does is there needs to be less explanation when someone does something. If you've done something your whole life and everyone does it, you don't really think about it. But for us, for the younger Muslims that were growing up here in the West, especially, a lot of questions arise because we are now confronted with an entirely different culture, entirely different religions, entirely different systems. And often these things are going against us. Um, and I can explain that a little bit more, but um, so there needs to be explanation. So when I was growing up, it wasn't enough that my parents were telling me to pray. It wasn't enough that they were telling me to fast. It wasn't enough that they were telling me to you know, finish the Quran in the Arabic. I was confronted with the religion of Christianity. I was confronted with atheism. I was confronted with people who didn't do the things I did. And so my mind was thinking about this stuff. And, and you know, I have a, a, I know they said youth activist, I have a 10 year old son. And he asks me, and he's asked me this multiple times is, why is Islam right? Why is our religion right? Why is this correct? And those are questions that you may never face in the, in the Muslim world. But there are definitely questions that people here face. There are definitely questions that uh, the parents face here. And so we have everything that we do then <clears throat> has to have some comprehension and some understanding behind it. And so even something like Ramadan, even something just as you know, what we might say as simple as fasting needs to have some understanding. And in that way, we are a lot more um, in, in, in the situation maybe where the Sahaba were where they were being confronted with something new, where they were confronted with something that they, they needed to understand to practice. And so uh, the topic Muslims after Ramadan and on the slides, if you can see, I, I added, you know, where are we going? Because the, the question is, we look at ourselves right now. Ramadan is past. Um, we can look back at all the things that we did and we look at our situation currently and we take an assessment of it. You know, we know that Hadat Umar al-Khattab every evening, Every night he used to take a stick and hit himself with it and say, what have you done for your Lord today? He used to take an assessment of himself, an accounting of himself. And so we can take an accounting of ourselves right now and see, are we matching with what we did in Ramadan? Have we fallen? Um, and then the real question is, where are we going next? And so uh, let me see if this is, there we go. Four principal things that I wanted to discuss, and I just wanted to give you an overview of what it is. So Ramadan, number one, I want to place it in context, is where, wh where is it in the grand scheme of our life? What is it for? Why are we doing it, number one? And then uh, maintaining the straight path, this concept of istiqama, you know, going straight, uh, being on the straight path and, and not swerving. And this will talk a little bit about the distractions that we face here, especially um, not just in, in, I would say, North America or, or the United States, I would say all over the world, because we now live in a global village because of social media and the internet. Third, I really, this is, um, really wanted to talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because ultimately it's about him. You know, I had a, a, a sheikh that used to say, and it sounded very strange to me, he used to say that we talk too much about Islam and not enough about Allah. And I always found that kind of an interesting statement, but what he meant was, Islam becomes this system of rules and regulations and things that we do. And sometimes we may lose sight of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what we're doing this for. And I really want to talk a little bit about just who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as much as we know about him, how vast and how powerful and amazing and beautiful that he is. And just end with, I think I have one slide on daily practices that can help us maintain our focus um, after Ramadan. So Ramadan, what is, what is it all for? Uh, this is actually the, I, I do photography for the new moon. So this is one of the photos that I took. Uh, so I, I don't need a copyright for this. <laughs> so the purpose of Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has told us in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kema kutiba ala ladheena min qabalikum la'allakum tattakum. Now, I'm sure everyone has heard this. Every Ramadan, alhamdulillah, we are given this ayah uh, during the different um, khutbahs. And, and we know this um, ayah. So, O oh, you who believe, ya amanu, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this is something, this is an action that's not new. So our five prayers, for example, may be something new. The forbidding us from drinking alcohol 
that may have been new. But this thing, fasting, is from the beginning. And this, we can even verify this, just, uh, you know, my friends who are Catholics, they're always doing Lent. And of course, that comes from Isa, Islam. it comes from his practice, and Musa Islam must have done this too. Um, so Allah was first explaining that you're not the first community to do this, that this has always been prescribed. So it makes it that much more important that this is something that humans have always done. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really gives the reason. Okay, what is it all for? He doesn't stop there and say that fasting is prescribed for you as it was before those before you. He says there's a reason behind it. And this is what I mean by the, the younger people growing up here and even in, in the entire world now because of you know, just our technology, they need to understand why they're doing the things that they're doing. So, and you, you notice on the slide, I have three different words here, righteous, ward off evil, learn self-restraint. Now, these are not my words. Tattakun uh, means taqwa. It's a different form um, of, of taqwa, but that's what Allah is saying is that you might become tattakun. And these are the words that I have here, righteous, ward off evil, and learn self-restraint are all from different translations. And if I give you three other translations, they'd be all different. You know, so the question is like, <laughs> which one is right? Which one is correct? What does taqwa mean? And really all of them, I would say are correct. The question really is, is how we understand the concept of taqwa. Because when you go from one language to another, it's, um, it, it can be very um, difficult and different sometimes to understand the word. But let me give you some other ayat that talk about taqwa so we can understand this concept. And that's really what I want to do today is understand what Ramadan was for. Because taqwa is not just in the month of Ramadan. Taqwa is everything. <laughs> Every part of our practice is taqwa. And so to understand really what it is, is the most important thing in understanding where we go from here after Ramadan is done. So after Al-Fatiha, which is the opening, which is the introduction, right? The first surah is Al-Baqarah. And right at the beginning, which is really beautiful, I think, in, uh, at the beginning of Al-Baqarah, Allah, Allah Ta'ala gives us the audience of the Quran. So when I was young, when I was in, you know, doing English in high school, the we used to write short stories or, or any sort of writing we used to do. The, our, our teachers used to say, um, establish or identify your audience. Who is your audience? Because often you might read an article and you might not like the article. You know, it may be something against the Muslims and you may say, oh, this article is terrible. That article probably wasn't meant for you. You know, um, Allah Ta'ala says here, Alif Lamim, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدَى لِلْمُتَّقِينَ This is the book, ذَلِكَ um, الْكِتَابُ in it is guidance sure without doubt to those who are muttaqeen. So right at the beginning, Allah Ta'ala is telling us this book is for, it, it's guidance for the muttaqeen. And that again is just like tattaqoon is, uh, comes out of taqwa, muttaqeen is coming out of taqwa. So, and if you, if you keep reading Al-Baqarah, many of you probably have memorized this, um, Allah Ta'ala describes who these people are that have taqwa. The first one is Al-Ghaib, right? So right before Salah, Allah Ta'ala says, this is for those who believe in the unseen. So just off the bat, maybe a side point a little bit to understand is that if you believe that the only thing that exists in our reality is what's before you, what you can touch and feel, you're not going to believe in this book. If you're a materialist or you're an atheist to the point where you're like, if, if anyone tells me something that's I cannot measure, I cannot verify with my senses, I'm not going to believe in it. You're not going to believe in the Quran. You're not going to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the mufassirin, the, the, the people who do the tafsir of the Quran, one of the things they say, al-ghayb, the greatest thing in al-ghayb is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. He doesn't disclose himself to us. He's hidden. And so this is what the Quran is talking about, muttaqeen. And then this other ayah, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amnu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. And the reason I put this ayah here is also, is number one, we have the first ayah in the Quran. 
And then we have this ayah where the Prophet used to often say this in the khutbah. And I'm sure you have heard this during the khutbah also with many of the uh, khatibs uh, mention this ayah. Oh, you who believe have taqwa of Allah as it is his due and do not die except as Muslims. And so again, the question is, Allah Taala is constantly talking about taqwa. It's constantly talking about that you have to have taqwa, that this is for the muttaqeen. What is Read Quran in English and Spanish. Thank you. Um, Free Quran in English and Spanish, sir. Do you want to respond Free to that? Free Quran in English can and you, Spanish. Can the focus uh, mute? So, oh, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank so the question is, what is taqwa? And this slide that I have here, um, I have, so, so the ayah right before it was um, Ali Imran 102. Have taqwa of Allah as is his due. Ittaqullah haqqa tuqatihi. Now this I've given you the top six or at least top five um, translations into English that I found for this ayah. And then the last one I have is a tafsir. And so you can see, it's very interesting how they translated this. Fear Allah as he should be feared. That's Yusuf Ali. Fikta, which he was one of the first English translators, observe your duty to Allah with right observance. Uh, Shakir, he, uh, he's a, a professor at Al-Azhar. Be careful of your duty to Allah with the care which is due to him. Ghali, I believe he's also a Al-Azhar professor. Be pious to Allah with his true piety. Mustafa Khattab, I also think he has a, uh, a background at Al-Azhar. Um, I think he's, I believe in Canada, but he translated as be mindful of Allah in the way that he deserves. And Muhammad Shafi was an a in, Indian scholar. In his tasir, he says, have total obedience to Allah in awe of him. So again, none of these are wrong. None of these are you know, more correct, maybe. The, all of these ulama, all of these scholars are trying to uh, translate this very important and vast term into English. And English doesn't have the words to really contain this word, to really explain what it means. You have to live it. You have to be around it. You have to have some understanding of it. And, and just to give an example of why it's so important to read the Quran in Arabic and why it's so important to have understanding in Arabic. Um, I think uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf was a long time ago was talking about the concept of reality. And he was saying, he, and he does this in audiences, and I've done this with audiences and asked them, what is real? Show me something that's real. And usually the answer I get is people go, they look at a chair or they look at something that's in front of them and they'll touch it and say, this is real, right? And he said, you're right. This is what Shaykh Hamza said. He said, they're correct. Because real, if you take the root in Latin, it comes to something you can observe with your five senses. But in Arabic, if you go and ask the Arabs, what's the closest word to real? It's al-haq, right? Al-haq translates closer in English to truth. And if you ask them what is al-haq, it's definitely not something you can touch. It's actually the opposite. Allah is al-haq. It's one of his names. And so, again, if you're speaking in Arabic, if you're thinking about reality and what uh, truth or what reality means in the, for the Arabs, just with their language, without any understanding of the Quran, it would be something that they cannot see. It would be their Lord. It would be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, something that's true. And they would say that these things that we can touch are absolutely untrue in the sense that they will fade on the day of judgment. Another example is al-yawm. You know, uh, al-yawm does not mean, it, it means a day. Al-yawm is a day. But it does not mean a 24-hour day. So the Prophet sallallahu has explained in, in a hadith that you know, the Yawm al Qiyamah. And then he's explained that it's this many days, like 50,000 years is Yawm al Qiyamah. See, it wouldn't make sense in English. Um, it would be, Yawm might mean something like an era. And, and why this is important, for example, for, for some of the, from some of the Christian groups, you know, they have the same verses that, they have the same concepts that we have that the earth was created in six days. We might say the earth was created in six ayam, right? But some of the Christians took that literally. They translated the word. They forgot what the initial word was in Hebrew, which was yom, just like our yom in Arabic. 
And they said day. And so they said it has to be six days. And so the earth has to be 5,000 years old. And now they're stuck because evidence shows that the earth was much older and then they have to battle these things. And so it's very important to have the language um, correctly. So we're going to keep going into taqwa and try to understand it. Now, Ibn Rajab al-Hambali, he was a great scholar of the past. He has a, a commentary on the 40 hadith that Imam Nawawi compiled many years ago. And so he really looks at the concept of taqwa. It's a very long chapter, but I took some of it, uh, which I found very interesting. This part I wanted to share with you. He says that the linguistic origin of taqwa means that the slave has a barrier, a wiqaya, right? It's like a wall that, this, that the, the slave erects a barrier or constructs a barrier, a wiqaya, that will protect him, taqi. This is the word where it's coming from, from what they fear. So that's what taqwa is coming from. It's you build up something or you put a wall up to protect you something that you fear. And he says, and this is amazing, the second bullet point, he says taqwa in religion is the barrier between us and God's anger, displeasure, or punishment. So it's the protection that we put up between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger. That's what taqwa is. And it's a very, uh, it can be scary almost to think about that. But when we get into disobedience, when we do things against other people, maybe I, I take someone's right away, right? I should be fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he's going to be just and that he's going to give their, that person their right. I mean, how many humans commit so many injustices against other humans? I mean, it's common. You just have to open the television. You see it everywhere. So you should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when someone is talking about taqwa as fear, it is. When someone's talking about taqwa as God consciousness, it is. It's all of these things put together. And so let's keep going and see um, what the Sahaba said. Abu Huraira uh, radiallahu an was asked about taqwa. And in one version, I know it was a different Sahabi. Um, I forget his name, but um, one of the versions says that it was Abu Huraira who was asked about taqwa by somebody else. And Abu Huraira said that if before you there was a path covered with thorns, how would you behave? So again, he's not giving them the definition that taqwa is X, Y, Z. He's giving them an example, an illustration. He says, if you were standing in front of a path full of thorns, how would you act? And the person says, I would avoid it. I would step over it or I would stop short of it. And he says, this is taqwa. Meaning in matters of religion, we have sins, we have, we have things that we have to avoid. And when we're careful, we're careful about Allah's religion. Because a lot of us, unfortunately, um, astaghfirullah, we, we take the religions very easy. We think of Allah Ta'ala, astaghfirullah is very small. You know, I, I'll commit this sin, I'll, I'll make a prayer. I mean, I, I remember someone telling me that, you know, they didn't really practice the religion. They're like, what's the big deal? At 60, I'll go to the Kaaba, I'll ask forgiveness, all my sins will be forgiven and I'm good. You know, it's, it's like you treat Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala like you would treat, like he's, he's something that's, that didn't, he's not the one that created intelligence. He's not the one that created these things. And so just being careful that we don't step on someone's right. Imagine, I mean, we call ourselves Abd. We're slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if you had a king, if you had an emperor before you, you know, you don't want to upset them. You're careful of what their decrees are. If they have a decree that says, you know, we have turmoil in the land. No one goes out, out after 10. There's a curfew. Stay indoors or there will be a punishment. People will be careful because they see the consequences. But with us, oftentimes, because we don't see the consequences from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? I can miss my prayers. I can miss my Ramadan. You know, I can disobey my parents. What's going to happen to me? Nothing. You know, as long as I keep living, it's, it's all good. Nothing. You, you won't see the consequence until Yom Al-Qiyam, until you stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of our limbs start speaking, right? All of our actions are shown before us. Every single person that's wronged is going to come asking for retribution. That day, the consequences are going to be there. That's going to be a day that, you know, no one, you know, Allah Ta'ala says that even the mother will throw a child. And so often this, this, the fact that Allah Ta'ala has given us respite, the fact that all of this is delayed, makes us comfortable.
a hadith from uh, Yazid ibn Salama. He said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I heard many different things from you, and I'm afraid that the last of them will make me forget the first of them. So tell me something all encompassing. Like, tell me something really important because I forget things. I, you know, this is what he's kind of saying to him. Tell me something really profound. The Prophet said, Have taqwa of Allah concerning that which you know. Concerning that which you know. Now, the reason I put this hadith here is because I wanted to explain something very important is that when we said earlier, have taqwa of Allah as is his due. There's an ayah in the Quran that relates to this hadith. Um, and just the first part of it, this ayah is in Surah Taghabun. And I just want to focus on that part. So have taqwa of Allah as best as you can. So the mufassireen, again, the, the people of tafs- the, the scholars of tafsir, what they said was that the companions, when they got this, the first ayah, ittaqallaha qatu qati, the one in Ali Imran, they got so uh, scared almost. They said, how can we have taqwa of Allah as is his due? And they were petrified. And what this kind of showed this also very interesting is for the Sahaba, their yaqeen, their real belief, their understanding was so complete because in front of them was the Rasul uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they believed it like it was real, everything. They had no doubt in it. For us, I don't know where we are, where we fall on that spectrum. But when they got an ayah like that, imagine you heard that, and you get petrified. You're like, how can I possibly give Allah his due? And you're walking around thinking about it. And this was the state of the Sahaba. And so Allah Ta'ala revealed, and some of the Mufassirin are saying that this ayah came down to allay that fear. So Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is so merciful that even though he has said as is his due, he follows it up with فَتَّقُوا مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ So have taqwa Allah as best as you can. As much as is in your power to do, have taqwa of that. And don't get depressed and don't get overly thinking about the mistakes that we make. And so this gets to really the month of Ramadan. You know, in the context, we were talking about taqwa so much. What was the month of Ramadan really trying to do for us? Why in this month, is, is, why is fasting something that is, is the goal is taqwa? How does it do that? So in, in, in this country, for example, I know when I was young, we heard New Year's resolutions, right? On the December 31st or whenever it is, you think of some resolutions and you try to implement them. And there's, you know, there's nothing associated with it. The Muslims, if you can think, it's like a New Year's resolution. It's like a resolution that you're trying to make, but it's followed up with a practical month making you trying to break our bad habits. And that's associated with fasting. So fasting, again, what is it? It's hunger, right? You stay away from hunger. You stay away from your spouse. Why is it doing anything? Because it's interesting. If I came really, really hungry to the masjid to pray Asr, let's just say it's not Jamaat, but I'm praying. I need to pray Asr. I'm very hungry. I shouldn't pray. I should eat, fill my belly as much as I need to, and then pray. Because what's going to happen? I'm going to keep getting distracted. I mean, we all know this, that we all get distracted if we're praying. But in Ramadan, it's the opposite. The hunger in Ramadan takes us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time we get hungry, we think of him. Every time we're hungry, we think of controlling ourselves, right? Someone in a car may cut you off in Ramadan. I mean, this is, especially in Houston, this is something that's very common. Someone will cut you off. Someone will drive badly. And you just want to, you know, it, there's nothing like road rage. You know? I've seen the calmest people. You know, mashallah, my brother-in-law is the calmest person that I know. And when you get into a car in road rage, it just something happens. You know, you get so upset. But in Ramadan, you're fasting. In Nisa'in, I'm fasting. Someone's getting mad at you. Someone's getting upset. You're about to maybe curse, use bad language. In Nisa'in, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. And what happens also is that what's interesting when Ramadan starts, the first night of Ramadan, and depending on the, the, you know, the moon is seen and what the fighting is and all that, but 
let's just say the second night of Ramadan, when everyone knows it's Ramadan, the masjid is just packed, right? People are kind of getting used to it, the parking issue, and it's just subhanAllah. So many people in the masjid, you didn't know so many people were in the community, you're having to pull out carpets, you know, it's just a beautiful feeling. What's amazing is that when the 10 nights come, the 21st night shows up, there's this relaxation then, it's kind of hard then. And that's natural. And, you know, I was trying to look for some research about, you know, just non-Islamic research about how to break a bad habit. And the actual research, the scientific research I found, it wasn't very helpful. Some people can break a bad habit in 25 days. Others, it takes like 100 something days. But interestingly, I found a lot of these, um, it, it, I would call them maybe amateur websites that are trying to give you, give you help and motivation. It's interesting, I saw four or five and the only numbers I saw were 28 to 30 days that it takes to break a bad habit. And I was just amazed that this is exactly the month of Ramadan is 29 or 30 days. And because that's how much that people are saying it takes for an average person to really try to break a bad habit. And the 20th or 21st day is when it really, you can tell because you should be the most exuberant and the most energetic on the 21st day because the 10 nights are starting but often it happens the opposite way. And so Ramadan is a, a practice for us with the fasting, with the number of days that we're fasting, we're tired, we're hungry, all of these things is to really see where we are. And of course we know spiritual, I mean, I'm just talking about the physical things. Spiritual, spiritually, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is chaining up the devils. He's chaining up the shayateen, that they're not even around us. It's our own nafs that's got a hold of us. But this is why Ramadan is so important is because that taqwa, trying to get that taqwa, trying to be careful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rules. Because there's a brother I remember from, um, he was from Syria. This was when I was, in, uh, when I was in university. And, you know, we used to try to get the brothers at the engineering. There's so many Muslims in the engineering building. Uh, we used to get them together to pray Jamaat. And there was these uh, brothers, I forgot which country they were from, from some Middle East somewhere, that they never came to pray. And so I, I remember asking him, I didn't know that. I said, hey, why don't you call those guys, those Muslims? And he said, no, no, no. They think they've left Allah Ta'ala back home. You know, it's this sort of, you try to take away the fact that there's a religion, there's a God. You try to put him in a box, Allah, that he doesn't really exist. And that's what happens outside of Ramadan many times. In Ramadan, it's just in our face. And often we have to be better than we usually are. And so the next part I want to talk about is maintaining the straight path, is taqama. And there is, again, what happens after Ramadan? The whole point of this topic is, you know, Muslims after Ramadan is where do we go from here? Why does this, you know, the lot, Eid comes, Alhamdulillah, we have a good time with our families, we eat. And the next day it's like, oh, no more. I don't need to go to the masjid. I don't need to you know, do extra Quran. I don't need to go after prayer. And then we start slipping. And so this concept of istiqama is extremely important. And I wanted to give, I found this very interesting. My brother was telling me about this. I read this book many years ago. You may have heard of it, A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Now look at the year. This was written in 1931. And the book is about this future time from his standpoint, where people don't really care about, you know, morality or God or any of this stuff. And they have this character, uh, they call in the book, the savage. Okay. He's someone that had dropped out of this technological world and he believes in God. He's a simple guy. And so he's asking the person from this society, like the leader of the society, he says, it is natural to believe in God when you're alone, quite alone in the night, thinking about death. And the person responds to him, but people never are alone now. We make them hate solitude and we arrange their lives so that it's almost impossible for them ever to have it. Ever have what? It's impossible for them ever to have solitude. It's impossible for them to have this thing that the, the, the first quote is talking about when they're alone at night, when their minds are working, when they start thinking about their death, when they start thinking about God. And he's in this, in this fictional book, he's saying, we've taken it away from them. They're never alone, right? I mean, this will never leave you, right? 
there was a khatib I remember was saying, this is more important than the Quran to us. Because this, if, if we lose this for an hour, it's like chaos, right? And I'm not saying it's all bad. Of course, you know, we have to keep in touch with our families. We have maps on here. I mean, this is it's an important tool. But ask yourself, how much time? I mean, ask myself first, but ask yourself, how much time do you have in a day, in a week, in a month, just with your own thoughts, just with your own mind? And I mean, think about where the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was when the revelation came to him. Right when the Iqra from Jibreel السلام, came to him, where was he? He was in a cave alone. He would go there for weeks on end sometimes, take food with him. He was alone. He was thinking about things. He was reflecting. He had his own mind. And in a cave. How much time do we get? I remember when I was going to university, I remember thinking, I actually, you know, I was talking to a brother here about the commute from Sugar Land to downtown, you know. But I remember thinking long time ago, I turned off the radio, no music in the car. That 35 to 40 minutes to get downtown from where we were living was the only time I had to think about things. You know, otherwise it's very hard to just have time, especially now with, um, you know, with things trying to engage us. And I remember telling my, my son, you know, it's really interesting when, when the light goes out sometimes, you know, when these storms come through Houston, and the light goes out. And if it's, long, if it's long enough that the phones die, the kids just freak out. They're, they don't know what to do. They're like, what, what did people do for 10,000 years? You know, They don't understand. And what's interesting is people come out of their houses. They start talking to their neighbors. The kids start playing in the streets. And it's this amazing thing. And you think maybe this is how it was in the past, that people were communal. They had a lot of time that were not spent on their phones. They weren't glued to Netflix. They weren't glued to, you know, I don't know how many different live streaming things there are now. So I'm, I'm not here to bash technology. What I'm trying to say is there are forces beyond human control even that are keeping our, our, our attention engaged and trying to distract us. So what he's saying here, Aldous Huxley in Brave New World, saying that we try to take away people's solitude and keep them engaged always. What are you being engaged with? There's an interesting, I mean, speaking of Netflix and watching Netflix, there's an interesting documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. You may have heard of it. But it's very interesting because what I liked about that, I haven't seen the whole thing, but this, this social dilemma brings some of the top engineers who built things like Facebook and Google and all these different social media platforms, Instagram, and they built these things. And they talk about, you know, many of them talk about how dangerous it's gotten. You know, one of the main engineers who was pivotal in, in the formation of Facebook and, and other social media things, you know, these guys moved around to different companies. He was saying he has an automatic thing that shuts off the internet at 9 p.m. in his house. You know, the, the person who creates maybe Instagram, I, I forgot which social media platform it is. He said he didn't even let his kids go on there. And, and one of the people that came on there, he said, I mean, just, just to think about how it's keeping your attention because a lot of times we try to break our habits. We might think, man, I'm spending way too much time on YouTube. And sometimes if you look at your history and you're like, wow, I cannot believe I saw like 50 videos in, in this much time. And, and you think about it, so like, how did this happen? Often what's happening is there are things even beyond, and I say beyond our control with, a, with an asterisk in the sense that it's in, within our control, but you're, you're fighting something that's very difficult to fight. That, and, and I'll give you an example. On, in this, in this uh, documentary, social media, the person, you, you know, so back, I'll, I'll back up. I'm getting, getting confused with my thoughts. On your phone, when you get an update on Facebook or you get an update on Instagram, often it's this little red um, button, you know, a little red indicator with a check mark or something that tells you. So he was explaining this, that he was the first one that created this for Facebook. And he said when he initially started it, he made it, Either it was green or blue. I think it was blue. He made it blue. And he said, just based on their algorithms and they were checking, they said they weren't getting them any hits because he changed it to red and it went through the roof. When you make something red like that, just our brain, suddenly you have to click it. You have to check it. So if you have 10 apps on your phone, all have those little red dots, you're going to be constantly checking them. You put it away and then 
You put your phone away. Five minutes later, you hear a little bing. You take it out. You have more red and you check. And they're saying that this is what they do. They try incrementally to change things, do things. And what is the whole point of this? It's to keep your attention on whatever platform you're using, whether it's YouTube or Facebook. They're constantly trying to change things. So for example, YouTube, they're just videos. You click on a video you like, you switch for a video, it'll give you suggestions. What they found was that, you know, this, uh, um, it's on Instagram, I think it's the one with these two minute videos of people, TikTok. <laughs> so TikTok they found was going huge. So YouTube uh, introduced these little shorts, YouTube shorts, just to mimic TikTok because they found that it was, it was doing amazing. People were clicking everything. So they're like, let's do this on our platform because they want to keep your attention engaged. And what is their reason? What is their purpose, right? Uh, what the, uh, one of the other uh, gentlemen on this, um, in, in this documentary was saying that every time there's a, there's a transaction being made, something, you, you have a, a seller, you have a product, and you have someone who's buying it. As he said, if you look at what's happening with the social media, whenever you have something that's free, he said, be very careful of what's happening in this transaction. Because if I'm going to buy this, you know, this, if I want to purchase a car from you, simple transaction, there's a product, I want it, you have it, I pay you, transaction's done. If you're watching videos for free, what's going on? And he said, the platform is the seller. The advertising company is the buyer and you are the product. That's what he was saying. It's amazing. He said he, the people watching these things are the product. They're the product being sold to these various ad companies. And it just, it, again, it, it makes you think about what's happening to us. Oftentimes we're trying so hard, you know, to think about, I have to read this much Quran. I have to, you know, go to the masjid and we're on these social media platforms and things because things are happening even beyond our capability to fight a lot of these things. And so we have to be very careful about this. And also, of course, the, the hadith uh, that Abu Huraira radiallahu narrated, Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, the hellfire is surrounded by all kinds of desires and passions, while paradise is surrounded by all, ki all kinds of disliked, undesirable things. And, and, and this is a reality of what it is, because the things that distract us, that take us suffer off the path, off the straight path, are the things that our nafs loves to have, are the things that we try not to do in Ramadan, are the things after Ramadan we're trying to stay away from, and the nafs is just like a magnet towards these things. Um, and so we have to be very careful. Another hadith, Abu Amr, um, Sufyan ibn Abdullah, he was also called Abu Amra. He said, um, he's narrating this. I said, Messenger of Allah, tell me something about Islam which I can ask of no one but you. He وسلم, said, say, I have Iman in Allah, then go straight ahead. And this is the concept that we, again, this concept of going straight, not swerving, not being distracted by the things that are trying to pull us off the path. Think about it, Al-Fatiha, the surah we recite most, right? I mean, you know, I, I, the, the, the brother that um, very nicely introduced me was saying that I'm, I'm studying Shafi fiqh. The Shafis are very big on, you know, having your intentions straight, but for them, the Fatiha has to be recited even by the followers. And I found it very interesting. So in Shafi Masajid, if you're there, um, the Imam recites Fatih and then he pauses and waits for everyone to recite Fatih and then he continues. This is how it's often done because you have to recite Fatih. And in Fatih, what are we asking? <laughs> Guide us to the straight path. Every single time. I mean, you know, it, at least twice in every Salah, even in Fajr, at least twice we're saying, and this is the concept, it's the comma. That's, that's where the word comes from. Is the Prophet ﷺ is saying, say, I have Iman in Allah, but I have faith in Allah, I believe in Him, and go straight ahead. And uh, just some, some other, um, I don't really have these on a the slide, but I want to mention some of the things that um, from different Sahaba. Abu Bakr, عن, he said that someone who is um, on the straight path, 
he, so all of these these verses, uh, these uh, commentators, I'm going to say, are talking about this concept of istakama. He said they do not turn away once they're moving straight. This is Abu Bakr radhi um, Ibn Rajab, al-Hambali that I mentioned earlier, he says istakama is traveling the straight path and it is the correct deen without turning away from it to the right and to the left. That's really what we're talking about, is you have this world full of distractions and trying to pull you away from the straight path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we need to try to get on straight. And now, you know, there's other hadith that say that you will not be able to stay on the straight path. You know, Allah ta'ala does not expect perfection from us. I and mean, he created us, he knows us. So the thing to do is do tawbah, right? We get off the path, we get back on, we do tawbah. We get back off, we get on the path, we do tawbah. And so, um, in um, the, the reason I had this in the title that, um, you know, Muslims after Ramadan, where are we going? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, fa'ayna tadhabun, you know, in Surah Taqweer, fa'ayna tadhabun, in huwa illa dhukrul lil alameen, liman sha'a minkum an yistaqeen. When, or, or sorry, where then are you going? Allah ta'ala asks. This is nothing less than a reminder, a remembrance to all of creation, all of the world. Alameen, for whoever of you decides to go straight. The same question. I was asking, where are you going? And he said, it's a reminder from him. And then he says, go straight. And so the next, um, I'm going to go through these slides next very quickly. But I wanted to, this is something that I love to do is astronomy. So I want to really get a sense of whoever may not know all these things, and you may already know these things if you're interested in astronomy, but it's really who are we worshiping? Who is it that we have taqwa for? Who are we reflecting about, right? This is not something small. Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we really think about him? We don't have a form for him like other people, like other religious groups. He's abstract, meaning we have no, we know he's nothing like the creation. And so the, 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 the real, the question is, what can we learn about him from his creation? When you want to see, um, you know, maybe a painting, right? People can look at a painting and say, oh, this is Picasso. Someone can look at another painting and say, oh, this is Da Vinci, right? Or you have a beautiful poem and someone can say, oh, this is Iqbal, I know this beautiful poem. This world around us is, um, you know, just it's, it's, it's the grandeur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seen through these things. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ the believers are those when Allah is mentioned, their hearts tremble. There's a fear, there's a tremor in their hearts. And when his verses, the, his signs are recited to them, it increases their strength, it increases their faith, and upon their Lord they rely. And then the word here, um, their hearts tremble, is wajilat. Uh, and it's not khawf. Khawf is something that you fear because you're scared it will do you harm. Wajilat is like a, um, it's like an awe. It's something so awesome, something so grand that your hearts tremble. And so here Allah Ta'ala is saying that the believers of those, just when his name is mentioned, Allah, a tremble goes through our hearts. I mean, remember, this is Allah Ta'ala showed himself a little bit to the mountain when Musa Islam asked to see him. And the mountain started bowing. It literally started crumbling and bowing out of the intensity that Allah Ta'ala had. And there's a hadith, I, I didn't put it up here, but there's a hadith where Rasul Sallam tells us five things. And one of those things he says that Allah Ta'ala is cloaked in light. And he says, hijabu hun nur. He actually says hijabu hun nur. His hijab, his covering is nur, is light upon light. Another narration of Rasul Sallam said, um, you know, there's a debate on whether the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually saw Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala or not. Um, scholars differ about that, but he did say that it was light upon light, and that's all he saw. And in that same hadith, he mentions that if this veil was lifted, everything of the creation would be burned, everything of the creation would be consumed by his grandeur if he uh, showed himself. Um, one of the my my sheikhs, he he was saying. 
he mentioned the story that, um, and I'll go through this quickly. Uh, I'm just going to paraphrase it. Isa alayhi salam, this is a story about Jesus, um, that there was a man that had asked Isa alayhi salam that I want to be able to see Allah with full khushua, meaning with full awareness. Not that he's in the ghaib, I want to see him like I'm looking at him. And Isa alayhi salam says, no, it's not possible. And he said, give me a percent of that as if I'm seeing him. And Isa alayhi salam says, no. He says, give me a percent of that percent. And Isa alayhi salam thinks, no, but he says, fine. I'll make dua. He's, an, he's a nabi. He's a rasul. I'll make dua that you can see a percent of the percent of the khushu of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He comes back a few days later, the story goes, and the man's not there. And Isa alayhi salam gets concerned. And he asks the people, where is this man? And they said, he went up to the mountain days ago and he hasn't come back. So Isa alayhi salam goes towards the mountain. He starts going up and he's, he's worried about this man. And he sees the man at the top of the mountain looking up. And he sees that the man is not blinking. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't slept. He's just staring up at the sky like this. And as Isa alayhi salam approaches, he gets wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if you were to cut him with a sword, he would not feel it. And then look at the next thing that, uh, that he said. Allah Ta'ala revealed to him, out of my mercy, I hide myself from you. He said, out of my mercy, out of rahma, I keep myself in the ghaib. He is a powerful Lord that we have, and we often don't think about him. And so very briefly, now I'm going to run through these slides. Um, my time is coming up. I wanted to give you a, an indication of the vastness. Now, what's amazing about this is, more than 100 years ago, no one knew about this. Maybe the Anbiya, they probably knew about this, but no one really understood this. We didn't have a telescope until the you know, 17 or 1800s um, in, in the common era, but the vastness of our universe with these telescopes, we can actually see what Altal has created, at least what we can see. And so, you know, when I was even young, I remember light speed, right? We wanna quantify light speed in one second. So if I say one steamboat or one Mississippi, it's gone around the earth seven and a half times. That's how fast light speed is to give an understanding. It takes light from the sun to reach us 8.3 minutes. That's how far it is. It gives you a sense of how far the sun is. Okay. Now our solar system, right? It takes the sun and I'm not sure if you can see the arrow on the screen, but it takes, this is us right here. Eight minutes, 17 seconds. And as you can see, as we keep going further and further out, you can see how far it takes the light to travel. And the way that Allah has created the universe, the way that his laws exist, if the sun, for example, were consumed and just went out, it would take Pluto, which is over here, five hours to notice. <laughs> the light is traveling. It would take five hours and 28 minutes for light to get to Pluto. And this is just our solar system. This is just... Uh, the planets and the comets and all these things um, that are pictured here, just around our sun. And then I have this image about the Centauri system. There's Alpha Centauri, and there's a little one here that I didn't put here, Proxima Centauri. It's about four light years away. This is the closest star system to us, the closest. There's about 200 to 300 billion stars in our Milky Way galaxy. This is the closest star to us, light would take four years to get there. And these are the closest stars to us. Some of them we see in the night sky. Sirius is the brightest star. And so you can see the numbers here. So you, you, those of you who are watching this, uh, sorry, the presentation may not be able to see it. But this says 10 light years, 20 light years, 40 light years, and 80 light years. You know, and, and interestingly, a lot of the stars were, have Arabic names like Aldebaran, Altair, because the Muslims are very interested in these things, but back um, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. But even so, the closest stars you can see, 80 light years away, quickly you get there. And this is just our little neighborhood in the Milky Way galaxy. And so the next slide I have is the Milky Way itself. How long traveling that fast at light speed would it take to cross our entire galaxy from one end to the other? Scientists have told us 100,000 light years. 100,000 years to go and cross the, the Milky Way galaxy. And they're saying here, what I have here is listed 200 billion stars. And I'm not sure if you can see, for those of you who can see the presentation, whoops. This little dot 
is just our solar system. And all the stars that I mentioned earlier were just in this little area of the Milky Way galaxy. Now, this is the closest galaxies to us. This is the Milky Way here where we are. And the largest one that we see in the night sky is the Andromeda galaxy, M31. And to get there, this next image shows would take 2 million light years to get to one of the closest galaxies to us. And this is a picture of the Andromeda galaxy, you know, taken at a very high exposure. I thought it interesting, 964, again, this is a CE, the Persian astronomer Abdul Rahman as Sufi described the galaxy as a small cloud in his book of fixed stars, the first known report of our nearest neighbor. See, the Muslims in the past were extremely interested in these things. They wanted to know what the universe was about because what you're doing when you're looking at the universe, you're seeing a lot of the handiwork. You're seeing his actual creation. You're seeing the size and the immensity that if the closest star to us is four light years away, the closest galaxy to us is 2 million years away from us, 2 million light years away from us. And I have this slide here kind of showing that this is how they have to show the size of the universe is we have the earth, you have the solar system, and then you have what they call the solar interstellar neighborhood, meaning all the different stars that are close to us. Then you have the Milky Way galaxy, which we're a little speck inside it. Then you have the local galactic group. Where there's, you know, 16 different galaxies in that. And the Virgo supercluster is where our Milky Way galaxy have hundreds of galaxies in that. Local superclusters and an observable universe. Um, and I'm going to end with this very soon. This picture that I had at the beginning of this section is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. What they said is this view of, and I got this from the NASA page, this view of nearly 10,000 galaxies, the deepest visible light image of the cosmos, called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, this galaxy studded view represents a deep core sample of the universe cutting across billions of light years. And so what this is, is they took a speck in the night sky where they thought there were no stars, at least what you could observe any stars in the Milky Way. Every star you see is in the Milky Way galaxy. Every single star you see is in the Milky Way galaxy. And so they tried to pick a spot where they couldn't see it. And they took this and they exposed it over and over again. You see this picture here. There's 10,000 galaxies in there, just in the speck. So they estimate there are maybe a trillion galaxies in the universe that we can see. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creating this. And he says that if he were to lift his veil, he would consume all of creation. I mean, it's just subhanAllah, it's amazing. And we know that he says in the Quran that he created this out of nothing. And that's exactly what the scientists have found. I mean, subhanAllah, it's amazing that it literally, they say that, you know, it started from a speck, there was a big bang and then everything exploded into existence. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it important? The, the brother, um, mashallah, that recited at the beginning, he recited these verses. إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقَتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا بَابَ النَّارِ Right? Verily in the creation of the heavens and the earth and in the alternation of the night and the day, there are indeed signs for those of understanding. Those who remember Allah standing, sitting and lying down on their sides and think deeply about the creation of the heavens and the earth. Our Lord, you have not created this without purpose. Glory be to you. Give us salvation from the torment of the fire. And there's a hadith where the Prophet said um, that um, woe to the person that reads these ayat and does not think deeply about them. And I think I'm on my last um, slide now. Um, this I added here, this is purely for myself, daily practices. This is a thing that we really need to do after Ramadan is thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thinking about our goal in Ramadan is taqwa, is how can we maintain istiqamah? How can we maintain the straight path? And what I found is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he likes small acts that are done often. This is the key to it. You know, we often think I'll go to a conference and, you know, I'll two, three days I'll spend in the masjid, whatever it is, it's the little things. Every single day we emerge from our little deaths, which is our sleep. 
we emerge and it's a day that we have, that we need to think that we may not live till the next day. And so what I found is at Fajr, if we can do some of the dhikr after Fajr, right up till sunrise, whether it's a Quran, a page, four lines, some dhikr, some sunnah dhikr, subhanallah, bihamdi, subhanallah, we know if we do these a hundred times each, the benefits are amazing. I mean, small things that we just don't have time to do. Maybe at Fajr we do this. Prayers on time, right? Trying to get every single prayer on time. Pursue some knowledge. And again, it doesn't have to be a book. It doesn't have to be, it can be maybe an even an article. Something about the tafsir. This, I mean, most of the stuff that I have here is, there's so much stuff online now that the amount of tafsirs that are online that you can just read and understand. It's not just reciting, but reciting with understanding of what we're reading. Some hadith, some sira books, um, fiqh, you know, just to get our basic understanding of when does the prayer invalidate and when does it not. Um, attendance at the masjid at least once a day. Um, for me, Esha is the one that I try to attend because, you know, my work is done. Um, right now it's very late, so I, I don't know if I can take my kids. But really, we have to have at least some connection with the masjid. And when you come to the masjid, you meet the mashallah, the people here, and you, your hearts go closer. And every time I've seen there's some benefit that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give when we go to the masjid. Tawbah at night is extremely important because, again, we will not stay on the istiqamah. We will, not, we will always, for some reason, we, Allah, we know the reasons, but we, we fall off the, the path. Get back on with tawbah, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that every time we commit a sin, that there's a black heart that comes in our, our sorry, there's a black spot that comes in our heart. And so if we don't do tawbah, it just keeps adding and adding and adding until our heart becomes black. And so we have to do tawbah at night. Sit down after Isha, whenever before our sleep, whenever we're even in our beds laying down, and ask forgiveness for all the things that we did that day that we thought might have hurt someone. Or that we thought, I didn't pray on time. Ya Allah, Allah, forgive me. I made the qalab, you know, forgive me. I was, wasn't the best to my wife when we had this conversation. Forgive me for that. I yelled at my son or my daughter too much. Forgive me for that. I told a lie to this person. Forgive me for that. Just ask forgiveness. And the last thing is sleep early. A lot of the evil things are done at night. Fast Isha. The Muslims would sleep after Isha. They would pray and they would sleep. Because if you have a bad night, if you sleep late doing things that aren't good, your fajr will be ruined. And all this cycle will be destroyed. So inshallah, I'll end here and just say, Anything I said which benefited you is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mistakes are mine. Um, and you know, this, this, all of this that I'm saying is for myself first, it's for you afterwards. But um, that's all I had. Um, so if there's any questions or comments, yeah. welcome. Jazakallah khair, uh, Jazakallah khair, Brother Rehan, uh, Ustaz Rehan, uh, Alhamdulillah, Masha'Allah, this is a uh, very good um, talks uh, and uh, open our minds basically about the uh, the taqwa as well as the uh, the importance of understanding the grandeur of Allah so we make it make us our our heart khushu you know uh, um, humble ourselves and also the plan uh, simple plan but it's easy to do simple but it's easy to do to make it our uh, faith uh, keep our faith in the high level and then uh, keep uh, our ourselves in our uh, straight path istiqamah so inshallah uh, we're gonna open the question answer if you have if you are in the zoom uh, you can raise your hand if you want to talk directly or if you want to uh, put the question in the chat you can do that too um i already have uh, three questions here um jazakallah uh, khair we start for the talk uh, how do we respond to the atheists that say that we are so insignif uh, insignificant as human being on earth because we are like speck of dust why your god care about what we eat what we dress so uh, i'll just make a disclaimer first um you know um most of these questions i'm probably not the best one to answer i'll just give you my thoughts um you know there are ulema that i, I go to there are there are people that have a lot of understanding um, that, that can answer the, the question better. And, and, and even the, the person who's asking me probably knows better, but I'll give you just my thoughts about just my experience in talking to, um, and, and I, I like to engage with atheists, especially because it's very interesting to me. Um, you know, I've heard something similar and in, 
you know, for example, the atheist, uh, on one of the things I remember asked, you know, you're talking about this God who creates this massive universe, right? All the things I showed right now about the galaxies and the, you know, just the vastness, how just incredibly immense everything is. And this God is per, supposed to care about, I have a beard or he cares, you know, whether my wudu is complete if I wash myself or, you know, these insignificant things. And my, my view is, a lot of the, the people that say these sorts of things, they try to impose their own understanding on God, on, on the creator. Because for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creation is not something difficult. It's very easy for him to create. It's very easy for him to make all this, these things. And I'm saying where he creates something to make us just amazed at his creative power, humans will look at that and say, well, it's done for another reason or it's done for you know, something else. And they can't uh, capture a lot of these people that the thing that Allah really cares about are things like making someone feel bad. You know, or if there's a child being hurt and you protect them from it, those are the things that he really, really um, cares about. And, and for me, often with, with the atheist, um, I, I will, again, it's not a really an answer or, or, a, or a rebuttal, but it's, it's just explained to them that they're taking what their views, what they've grown up with and imposing that on this, this entity that is so powerful and so vast. And for us, we go to the Quran. We go to the Quran and we read it and we see what, what does Allah thought, thought want from us? I, I wouldn't know that he cares more about uh, uh, a child dying than maybe all the, the entire universe. That's maybe more important to him. So that's part of what, what I think is, you know, what points one person towards Allah will take the other person away from Allah. And interestingly, a lot of the atheists nowadays, they've, they've created this, um, this multiverse in response to where the, all this came from, right? The Big Bang, they call it fine tuning, right? It's so finely tuned. It looks so perfect. And so that kind of points to a God. And so what they have said, well, the multiverse theory takes care of that. And I'm not saying, well, I'm saying this, it's kind of interesting. And they go to the religious person and they say, you know, there are multiverses. You know, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimullah, or I think it was al al-Razi, he looked at the ayah, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, and asked, why is in this alhamdulillahi rabbil alam? Meaning singular. So he back then, this is more than a thousand years ago, was already talking about multiple universes back then because he said the way that Allah Ta'ala has framed this statement, there must be many universes. Um, so I, I think to me, that's the way I think about it. Allahu Alam, of course. Uh, Jazakallah Khair, uh, Ustad. Um, another question here. Um, as a new Muslims, uh, what should I do in order to maintain my spirit stay high? Uh, what will be uh, required uh, to always feel close to my creator? That's a really good question about how, when someone is, is coming from this, you know, newly to Islam, I, I think a lot of that for me, just growing up even in, in Canada, again, I wasn't a new Muslim, I was raised in a Muslim household, but you know, my, like I said, at the beginning, my culture, my friends, everything was from um, the land that, that I was in, it was Montreal, Canada, and it was not very religious, it wasn't Islamic. For me, what helped me most was to surround myself with good people, you know, surround myself in good places. Because if you look at your week and you look at where you're spending it, you will become like that. You know, if you're spending your week uh, with people that aren't so great, you're going to become like that. So for me, the best thing was to keep myself around the masjid, keep myself engaged in the Quran as much as possible. I mean, again, I remember when my sheikh before, he said something very interesting. He said, if you try to do Islamic things, whether it's read the Quran, whether it's read the Sira, and you feel it's heavy, don't do it. The only things we have to do are the fara'id, the far, the obligatory things, right? We have to pray, right? We have to give our zakat, our, our you know, the, the, the almsgiving. We have to um, fast in Ramadan. But apart from that, if we're not feeling into it, you know, I mean, the sheikh used to read fictional books on science fiction. You know, he used to keep one under his, uh, his area. You know, he, after he would get a little bit tired of whatever he was doing, he would pick that up and read it. There's nothing, no harm in that. So I think sometimes we press ourselves too much. If that's the case, don't. But 
for me, it's always been a question of surrounding myself with good people and just reading a little bit of Quran every day, because that is Allah Ta'ala speaking directly to us. You know, and often you open up a random page and you, subhanAllah, sometimes you read it and you're like, this is exactly what I was thinking about. Many of us have had that feeling. And so I always say for me, th those things done continuously and, and um, you, you know, oftentimes almost in a ritualistic manner are very helpful. Allah Alam. Uh, another question here is about uh, sin. So uh, we feel we commit sins daily and we kind of feel Allah will be upset with us every time we do tawbah but commit sin again and again. How do we over, uh, overcome this feeling? Uh, because some people, they don't uh, want to commit tawbah because they say it's uh, like playing with Allah. Um, three things I mentioned here. And again, this is not from me. It's just I've, I've heard these things from different scholars and the different ulama. Um, number one, what I remember is from one of the scholars that said that insan, the, the word insan itself that comes from nasa, comes from this concept of forgetfulness. Right. So the first story that we hear about with Adam and Hawa, you know, Adam and Eve, is this concept of forgetting, is lapsing. It's the first thing that he's telling us is that Allah Ta'ala gives them, you know, guidance on do not go near this tree and they do it. And then it's tawbah, right? And so one of the things we have to understand is, and, and I, I, I don't have the hadith with me, but I believe the hadith said that if you were a people, I talk, Allah Ta'ala is talking to all of us. If you were a people that did not sin, that he would destroy you and create a people that sinned and then ask forgiveness. And that's very profound if you think about it. If you were a people that did not sin, he would destroy you. Like angels don't sin, right? There's something in our creation, there's something amazing about us that the angels and even the jinn had to bow to us. But what, that, what comes with it is that we do sin. In spite of trying hard, we sin. And then the, the remedy is we make tawbah. Now, the third thing I'll mention is Hadad Ali radiallahu anhu, there's a, there's a saying from him, there's a man came up to him and it's almost a similar question that you asked was, um, what, is the, you know, what is the remedy for sin? And they said, he said, ask tawbah. Now go to ask, ask tawbah. And the man got up and said, well, what if you sin again? And he said, ask tawbah. He said, well, what if you keep sinning? Ask tawbah. And he, he, he asked like four or five times that Hadad Ali said, ask for tawbah. Meaning this is, and I think at the end, he said, the man asked, well, how, for how long should you keep going and asking tawbah? And he said, until you know that the sin has been forgiven. Meaning he gave an answer saying, you won't know. You will never know um, when you're forgiven until Yom Al-Qiyamah. But this is the state that we're in, is we are a people to look forward, okay? Ask your tawbah. If, if it's against Allah, if it's sins, Against Allah, ask for forgiveness. If it's sins against people, if I wrong somebody, you ask Allah and then you try to rectify that. But if we're talking about sins just against Allah, we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing. Keep asking for tawbah, sincerely. Try to remove the things in front of you. You know, there's that story about the man who killed 99 people, right? Many of us know that. If you don't know that, there's, you know, there's various versions of it. But this man kills 99 people. And he's trying to be better. I mean, I'm just paraphrasing it. And he kills another person. Even the man he goes to for help says, there's nothing for you. And he kills him. And he goes to another man and says, can I, can I, you know, can I be helped? And he says, yes, go to this town. And the, one of the things he said is go to this town and do not come back to this wicked place. Meaning remove the thing that's causing you to do this, whether it's a certain type of friends, whether it's the internet, whether it's the computer, remove the thing away. And, and that man who had killed 100 people by that time didn't do anything good. He was just trying to do good, just walking towards the town. And he died halfway. And I thought, I forgave him. It's a very beautiful narration, if you can, you know, I, I can give it to you later where it is. But that's the thing we have to do is understand, try not to sin. When we sin, just keep asking forgiveness sincerely. And then, you know, inshallah, that's Allah. Mashallah, Jazakallah Khair Ustaz. Um, I open uh, another uh, opportunity for uh, anyone here that you want to ask question directly, you can raise your hand. I receive uh, about a couple of questions also here. 
Okay, this question is uh, about youth. Uh, is that, uh, how we help some youth that feel discouraged to come to the masjid or Islamic events because of the behaviors of some Muslims over there? That's a really good question. So I've been involved in, just to give you some background and context, I've been involved in various masajid um, in Houston, in Montreal, I was very involved in trying to get the youth into the masjid. Um, my experience was usually that if the people that are organizing these events, um, you know, have an understanding of how to engage the youth, and I mean, I'm talking about just being kind and nice, right? Um, they need to protect those younger people. I had situations, I'm not going to name the masajid, where once someone in the middle of a halakha we were doing, uh, um, one of the elderly gentlemen came in and just started yelling at the, at the young people. You guys have no respect. You put your shoes here. You don't do this. And, you know, I got up and later I told the masjid committee, I said, if you ever let this person get into our halakha, we're going to go somewhere else because these kids are coming for the first time, many of them, right? They don't know. They don't get it at home. They don't get it anywhere else. And at school, their minds are not even coming close to Islam. So even the smallest thing that discourages them, they'll leave. And so I went, you know, I remember, uh, I think it was one of the other brothers went to the children and, and the, the younger people and said like, hey, don't worry about it. Try to be respectful of the masjid, which is important, of course. Um, you know, keep your shoes away, you know, put it together, but don't worry about that. We've talked to the gentleman. And I think the other part of it is maybe the masjid is not the right place. You know, we, with our halakas, what we used to do, I mean, you may have something similar over here. We used to have just a short talk, like 20 minutes. And then we just used to have food and sports. That's what it is, food and sports. And the halakha, uh, the Islamic lecture was not even that important. It was the camaraderie, the, the brotherhood that you get or the sisterhood that you get afterwards, being kind to people, asking about their day, what's going on, how's it? That's what's important. And I would say if, if the masjid is causing... I wouldn't say the masjid is causing anything. If if one or two people at the masjid are you know causing an issue, are being an impediment, try to deal with that. If not, um, go elsewhere. You know, we used to do it in parks in Montreal because we did have that issue with one of the masjid that it was causing problems. The same people were yelling at these young people, and so we would just have it at the park. Allah. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. Uh, there is another question here. Um, this is, I think, probably similar with before, but it's more. Uh, sometimes you are discouraged to come to the masjid due to some internal conflict among Muslim in the masjid, even just because of the, the difference in fiqh opinions. What would be the better solution to resolve this kind of issue? Yeah, I mean, I, just again, this is from myself. Everyone is different in how they. Uh, react and behave and, and you know growing up in Montreal there were massages all over the place and I always found that especially there's a there's two different groups in India that always go against each other and they for some reason always put massages right next to each other you know <laughs> and uh, you know but what I noticed was um, that if we're having the, the fiqh issue should not be an issue I remember someone mentioned a story to me in Egypt there was a scholar who was known to be one of the great scholars of Cairo. You know? And he was sitting there with the, um, we call it a tasbih in, in Urdu, you know, like the, the I forgot, misbaha, I guess in Ar the Arabs call it. The, the prayer beads. The beads, yeah, prayer beads, yeah. The prayer beads. And he was sitting there. And so he, they said a brother came from, you know, across the masjid, stood in front of him and said, this is bidah, you know. Don't, don't have this. This is not from the Sunnah of Rasulullah You know, and the people, what they said was interesting is that the Sheikh put it away and said, okay. You know, meaning this man knew so much, he could probably give him every proof and everything and, you know, just completely take apart his argument, but he didn't want to cause any issues in the masjid. And he said, if this will, you know, make it easy. So I think some of us, when we go, make it easy for people. You know, if, if, if there's differences of opinion, you know, our, the Sunni Islam is so beautiful because there's so much difference of opinion that's allowed, it's permitted, right? When I said I'm sh studying Shafi, fiqh, my, my father and them, they're, they're Shafi. My mother is Hanafi, okay? And that's what I grew up with, Hanafi. My friends are Maliki. 
There's people that I know that are alhamdulillah. There's people that, are, that I know that don't follow any method. The beautiful thing about Sunni Islam is that it accepts all of them in the sense that um, that's, I mean, you know, they say that four schools are allowed in Sunni Islam. That's a beautiful thing to be. So I think these type of things, I go to the masjid to pray. I'm going to the masjid to get closer to Allah. Um, these types of divisions, these type of disputes, if they're getting in the way, I, you know, I've learned to just stay quiet. I just learned, I've learned to stay quiet. And afterwards, if people want to talk outside the masjid, we can have a conversation. And then, you know, it's on us not to get angry. It's on us not to get upset. You know, we're all Muslims. We all are trying to do the same thing. Allahu Alam. Jazakallah khair, Ustaz. Yeah. Um, there is one question here that's probably... Um, uh not related but i think it's 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 a uh, relevance uh, the question is uh i converted to as a muslim's last ramadan do i need to redo my marriage with my wife could, could you repeat repeat the question so it's a it's a, it's a man so, yeah. so i converted to islam last ramadan do i need to redo my marriage with my wife um redoing the marriage uh I don't know. I would defer that question because it's a fair question. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. But, but what I will say is that if the person converts from to Islam, um, they have to do the nikah. Well, actually, no. I'm going to defer that. I don't know the actual answer, so I'm sorry for the one who asked. Um, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable answering that because I, I don't know the exact answer to that. I'm sorry about that. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Uh, yeah, hope, uh, hopefully the brother can ask um, uh, scholars that um, maybe special on, have specialty on this 50 uh, marriage. Uh, uh, so yeah. one thing I will say, it doesn't hurt to do it again. <laughs> it doesn't hurt to go maybe do the nikah again. That's what I know. It's like it wouldn't be harmful, but whether it's whether the marriage is valid, it should be asked to a scholar. Inshallah. Okay. Uh, last question here uh, is that uh, so what uh, oh no, it's this I think it's already it's kind of similar like before uh, if I can do several things in order to make Ramadan keep going in my daily life what is the most important things for me to do um, probably, probably that's the last question here. yeah yeah no I, I think um I would say it's a very individual thing. Whatever, what, what you, what, what work, I, I shouldn't say what works for you, but there are, you know, what you have seen, uh, for example, I'm just giving you an example. My, my wife and, and, and I are very different people. <laughs> so the things that really drive her closer to uh, the religion and keeping her on the straight path is the karma is different than me. And, you know, uh, one of the ways to measure and check how you're doing is to see if you are doing your obligatory things. If you're not, then there's an issue. But if you are and things are helping you, you should keep doing them. So my wife, for example, she loves to listen to different nasheeds and she likes to get, you know, she, she's a musical person. So she likes to do those things. Um, and I don't, I just, it doesn't, has never been affected me. It's, for me, it's more the study and reading books and really getting into the nitty gritty of it. And even just going, you know, I, like I said, I take my son to go see the stars and stuff that really helps me, you know, um, but things that we know always help uh, Quran, reading Quran with understanding is always something that should help you, you know, small and reading about the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sira, reading different hadith and, and some of the hadith books I would mention, um, you know, Riyadh Salihin by Imam Nawawi, the compilation that he has, uh, the, the Arba'in, the 40 hadith that he compiled, um, different hadith books like that. I, I, I wouldn't recommend going to, you know, Bukhari or Muslim or any of those, but go to the compilations that the different scholars have put together. And those hadith are just sometimes just amazing. And if you can get commentaries, I would, I would really recommend getting commentaries that you, that, you know, your scholar or whoever trusts that you can um, really talk about deeply those hadith or those ayat, the verses. Jazakallah khair Ustaz. MashaAllah, this is uh, good questions. <laughs> I think it's really uh, relevant to our topic uh, topics here. Uh, so, uh, okay, inshallah, we're going to close this. But before that, I want to ask Ustaz to give the summary. And also, uh, Ustaz, please make dua for all of us, inshallah. 
Um, so just, just to summarize what we really talked about, um, you know, Ramadan um, is a very special time. Alhamdulillah, we all got to experience it, you know. And, and one thing I would say is that I mentioned was whether we think it was a good Ramadan or a bad Ramadan, I mean, we shouldn't think like that. We're always moving forward. So we know that it was trying to get taqwa. It's not something that we just checklist off. There's something deeper in it is to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when Ramadan ends, um, we have to maintain that taqwa is not a seasonal thing. It's a, something throughout. And so we try to stay on the straight, straight path, istiqama, as we ask in uh, Surah Fatiha every single day, you know, Allah Ta'ala keep us on the straight path. There's a lot of distractions that will take us, um, try to take us away. And we need to fight those things as best as possible, remove those things in our life. And what I also mentioned was just understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really trying to get an understanding of how immense, how amazing, how beautiful, how grand he is. And so we always keep that in our minds. And the daily practices, I, I mentioned a few, um, but whatever you can do in your, in your daily practice to really think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to keep yourself focused is important and treat every day like it's your last think about death, think about returning to him and, and know at the end, we will stand in front of him and we will be judged. And, and, and that's, it's going to be a beautiful thing. It could be a very difficult day for us. Allah and so ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us uh, tawfiq. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us uh, taqwa. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us the means to have taqwa. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us istiqamah. I ask us that he guide us to the straight path. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take away the distractions that are constantly taking him, us away from him. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to, 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 to reflect upon him. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us some solitude that we can think about and comprehend his religion. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to really uh, think about his creation and his signs. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala There's uh, some technical difficulty in the Houston Masjid there. Can anyone hear me still? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So I think there's uh, the freeze, uh, uh, the Zoom uh, seems like from the Masjid Istiqlal at Houston. So inshallah, uh, we're going to close our um, gathering today. Uh, hopefully, it's beneficial for everyone. So we ask Allah that Allah grant us uh, knowledge, useful knowledge, and also um, a level of iman that is high like we experience during Ramadan, and also keep us istiqamah, uh, steadfast in our deen, and also uh, grant us well-being uh, with all our family family and friends inshallah that allah grant us the opportunity to meet again with the next ramadan next year inshallah amin ya rabbal alamin uh, let's close our uh, gathering with uh, kafratul majlis subhanaka allahumma wa bihamdika ashhadu alla ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik bismillahirrahmanirrahim wal asr innal insana lafi khusr ilal ladina amanu wa amilus solihat wa tawassaw bil haqqi wa tawassaw bis sabr Thank you all for coming. Jazakumullah khair. I'll see you next month, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih, Mas. Jason, how are you, Jason? <laughs> yeah, I think something's wrong with the masjid <laughs> uh, internet, maybe. In... <laughs> It happens. <Huh>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oke, okay, terima kasih semuanya. Iya, yeah, terima kasih. Terima kasih Mas Joko. Yeah.